É, boa tarde a todos. É um grande prazer e uma honra receber a professora Susana Toivanen, que é socióloga, professora do Instituto Karolinska e do Centro de Estudos em Desigualdades e Saúde de Estocolmo, depois ela vai se apresentar melhor, é, que está passando, é, na verdade, essa semana toda é, conosco, na, é, com os pesquisadores do Estudo Longitudinal de Saúde do Adulto, que tem uma forte vertente a respeito dos determinantes sociais da saúde, e por ser uma coorte de trabalhadores, é uma preocupação grande com a expressão das desigualdades sociais no âmbito do trabalho. É, então, a apresentação, como a Sheila disse, vai ser em inglês, porque a Suzana se sente muito mais confortável, e a gente agradece à escola por ter providenciado a tradução simultânea. E, em seguida, sim, as perguntas, os comentários, aí a gente pode fazer em português e, e ajuda. É, quero agradecer muito a Suzana ter aceito o convite para estar no seminário, para, estar, para preparar essa conferência, e passo então para ela. Obrigada. So, thank you very much. Maybe some of you have noticed that I'm wearing a Fiocruz pin. <laughs> I got this pin some time ago with the words that the one who has given this pin will always return to Fiocruz. So here I am. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor and a joy to be here and to share some uh, thoughts of my research and and research of uh, health inequalities, which I understand is an uh, important theme for you too. So, let me introduce myself or Chess a little bit more. I'm from Stockholm, Stockholm, uh, Sweden, and uh, I work at a research center that is called Center for Health Equity Studies. And it's a collaboration with uh, Karolinska Institute and Stockholm University. It's a research center dedicated for the study of health inequalities. And we have epidemiologists, public health specialists, sociologists like myself, psychologists, working together in different projects about he health inequalities. And my background is in uh, sociology of working life and sociology of health inequalities. So here are some of the th themes or topics that I am uh, working with. Um, presently there are a couple of projects. One is about working life and health among self-employed persons. Another project is about foreign-born persons, working conditions and health in Sweden. And uh, a recently accomplished uh, project was about uh, future working life and future workplaces, defined as offices, and what kind of uh, development there is in the future working life and what kind of challenges uh, and uh, possible stressors and uh, uh, exposures, risk for health um, in the new working life. But the basis for all, res for all my research is the social determinants of health and health inequalities in working populations and as in Sweden, as in many other countries, the working uh, labor market is very seg segregated by gender. Uh, so that's why gender and health is always in focus in, in the research as well. In Sweden, uh, uh, men and women work in very different sectors of the labor market, also in different occupations. So it's always important uh, to consider gender when you are doing research in the working life. So, I would like to start quickly um, by recapitulating what we mean by social inequality in health. Um, here, in the words with, uh, in, uh, by Margaret Whitehead, inequalities in health are systematic differences in health between different socioeconomic groups within a society. As they are socially produced, they are poten potentially avoidable and widely considered 
unacceptable in a civilized soci uh, society. And these inequalities arise because of the cir circumstances in which people grow, live, work and age, and also the systems put in place to deal with uh, illness. The con and these conditions, in turn, are shaped by political, social and economic forces. And uh, as you all, uh, all know, the WHO Commission on Social Determinants on Health, in their final report in 2008, uh, they concluded that re uh, reducing health inequalities is an, an eti ethical imperative because social injustice in, is killing people on grand scale. These are the words from the final report. And also, the Commission's overarching recommendations um, to reduce health inequalities. There were many recommendations, but these are the three overarching. And first, the Commission recommends that we could uh, reduce health inequalities by improving daily living conditions for children, adults, elderly. And this, this also includes improving working conditions and creating social protection policies that is supporting for all. Second, the Commission recommends that countries should tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money and resources, for instance that between women and men, by addressing inequi inequities in the way the society is organized. And the final recommendation is to measure and understand the problem and as assess the impact of action. And this also requires a strong focus on social determinants of health in public health research. So this is very important message from the WH Commission. I know that you all know these facts, but I, li I uh, like to comment them because I would like to come back to these later on. And looking from the Swedish perspective, we could do better regarding these recommendations. In fact, there has been a substantial increase in income inequalities in Sweden during the latest decades. And as I told you, the Swedish labor market is clearly segregated by gender and not so much is happening to change that, if you ask me. So this was a short background to health inequalities research. And uh, this picture here, this fig figure, shows the um, determinants of po uh, population health on the vertical axis. And uh, um, I would need a pointer here. But um, so these, uh, as you, of course, you all know these uh, determinants, they, they range from societal level to individual risk factors. And these societal risk factors are called the upstream factors, uh, the social determinants of health. Uh, and uh, they also, also uh, determine the, the distribution of the pr uh, individual risk factors. And that's why they, the social determinants of uh, health are often called the causes of the causes, because they they do determine uh, the personal risk factors, the individual risk factors. And of course, these social determinants of, uh, of health, they vary uh, across time and place. So they didn't look like this uh, 400 years ago, not here in Brazil or not in Sweden. So they are very uh, dependent on the context. And they also vary during the, the life course, early life, at birth, childhood, youth, in adulthood, and old age, during the life course of, of a person. And also, uh, the health inequalities are reproduced from one generation to another, from one parental generation to the health of uh, the children. 
So actually this picture summarizes very good the research that we are uh, conducting at the Center for Health Equity Studies in Stockholm. Um, and uh, that research is mainly based on uh, registers, national registers, and we also have quite interesting multi-generational registers, so we can study the reproduction of health inequalities from one uh, generation to another. So, uh, health inequalities research has been summarized in many, many, many books. And I would like to highlight a couple of them for you here. Maybe you all already have uh, read these books. The one is about um, by uh, Sir Michael Marmot, the front figure of the Whitehall studies. It's the status syndrome, how your social standing directly affects your health and life expectancy. And this book was published in 2004. And the other book is by uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, also from UK. The spirit level and why more e equal societies almost always do better. And this is a later book from 2009. Uh, the status syndrome provides research from the latest uh, 30 years. It summarizes and it dem demonstrates that the social status is cause of illness. Social uh, status determines the risk of heart disease, stroke, cancers, infectious disease and even suicide and homicide. And it's not simply about income or uh, way of living. Uh, or lifestyle, it is the psychosocial experience of inequality, how inequality makes you feel, and how much control you have in life uh, that affects your life and life opportunities and uh, your opportunities for full social participation. And this has a profound effect on health. And the spirit level, on the other other hand, arg argues that countries, countries that are, have narrower income differences between rich and poor have better health and well-being. For example, less obesity, drug use, teenage conceptions, stress and mental ill health. And these countries uh, always also have better welfare services and access to education social housing, transport, health care provision, and green spaces, and so forth. And uh, all these assets tend to be, be uh, better and more fairly distributed across the population. So the main message from Wilkinson's and Pickett's uh, book is that everyone does better in conditions where income inequality is, income equality is higher, and the equality, inequality is lower. So uh, these two books I really recommend to you if you, don't, if you haven't read. And the, the book, book by Marmot is um, stressing more the psychosocial explanatory uh, model of uh, health inequalities. And the book by uh, Wilkinson and Pickett is more about the material explanations to health inequalities. So they are very good combination and, and a way for you to uh, think about uh, how you, you yourself think that health inequalities uh, are produced and reproduced. So this was a little short introduction and uh, I'm sure you already know this. Um, you are here at the public, uh, School of Public Health. These are issues that you study every day probably. But I, I wanted to uh, make this little introduction uh, because it's important to keep these uh, facts in, in mind when we talk about working life. Because work and em employment relations are important factors in explaining the health and quality of life of populations. These factors have not always got su uh, sufficient attention in previous research in the health inequalities as the focus has many, many times been on state, status and consumption, for instance, health behaviors, and many preventive and public health measures have focused on interventions in changing these behaviors. 
But on the street level, when you talk to people, when you ask people, there is a full awareness that work it has an emo enormous importance in determining people's lives. And when you know somebody's occupation, you are very likely to know their income, their type of housing and neighborhood where they live, their cu cultural tastes, and a long list of other things, including health. So what you have, example, income, status, housing, depends very much on what you do, what you work with. So, so work affects uh, population health on several levels, as I'm trying to show in this figure. <coughs> the welfare state regimes and the labor market are on the macro level. Organizations and workplaces on the meso level. And individual workers on the micro level. And how these uh, pathways bef between the different levels um, that, that's not, uh, we don't know how that is. There, there is much work left to do. Um, and they are connected uh, in many, many possible ways. And also uh, how they affect health is connected. Um, for instance, the welfare state regime determines the function of the labor market and also the leg legislations, work re legislations then that influence organizations and workplaces to provide decent work environments. And of course, the welfare state uh, in influences also individuals' possibilities in the labor market to get a job and to have access to so social insurances, for instance, childcare or workers' compensation if you get ill from your work. And, uh, the uh, welfare regime can do much to help people to, to get a footing on the labor market. Exposure to physical hazards and uh, psychosocial risk in the workplaces, as well as distribution of shift work and irregular irre work arrangements, are socially distributed with a higher prevalence amongst the least educated or uh, people on the lowest socioeconomic levels. So clearly this figure tries to show the complexity of the research area of work, work health and work and health and health inequalities. And an institute of its own would be very revel relevant for this huge area. And in fact, we had that kind of institute in Sweden National Institute of Working Life, but that was sh shut down in 2007 by the newly elected center-right government. I would have very much liked to work at that institute, it was great. But uh, since 2007, uh, research in the working life and health has been very scattered in Sweden since we lost this wonderful uh, institute. And now research is conducted only at different universities, in different research groups, with not always uh, communication between them. Um, so what I'm trying to do now, uh, I'm going to give you, I'm trying to give you an overview of this huge area by commenting each level, each of these levels, and what type of research is commonly conducted at these different levels in relation to health, worker health and health inequalities. So, this, is, this figure shows the labor market and here up in this corner I'm uh, trying to keep you, uh, help you to keep in mind on what level we we are talking about. So now we are talking about the macro level, the labor market, uh, which is also defined by the re uh, welfare regime system, of course. So in the labor market, uh, uh, people, individuals are grouped ac 
according to their employment status. And we can, uh, we can uh, separate three groups, the non-employed, the employed, and the self-employed. And between these groups, we have quite huge health differences. The non-employed, or workless as they are called, uh, defined in uh, much of the, the research, uh, is a group that includes people who are unemployed, but also those that are economically inactive. And that could be uh, receivers of welfare benefits, loan parents, or those that are too ill uh, to work, that are on uh, worker compensation, or also uh, students and the people who are in training or retired. And this group is a growing category from the European perspective, where many, many countries are, um, as a consequence of the economic crisis, are now struggling with very high employment rates, as high as 50% uh, for in, in certain countries for certain groups. And the unemployment among young people is a really uh, difficult problem for, for many countries. So this group of non-employed uh, is an increasing group in the labor market and it also includes uh, marginalized groups like refugees and, and uh, uh, immigrants also many times. <coughs> so compared to the, uh, um, uh, to the employed, this, uh, this group of non-employed generally, of course, have uh, poorer health. And the other group that I would like to comment is the self-employed. Uh, and this is a group uh, that we have not studied so much in rela relation to health, and even less when it comes to research into health inequalities. So most previous research lumped this, uh, the self-employed together, even if this is a very heterogeneous group depending on which sector of the labor market um, the self-employed operate, and also the size of the enterprise, uh, whether they are uh, solo, ent uh, solo enterprises or um, micro enterprises. Most of the, the companies or the enterprises of the self-employed are, of course, small, <laughs> very small companies. And previous research tend to find that the self-employed report their life and job satisfaction higher than the em employed. Uh, previous international studies tend to report this. And of course, having higher control over your life and over your job is certainly an important factor with, uh, with, um, with an influence for people's health. But... Um, from Sweden, we do not have uh, any register-based uh, uh, research regarding the self-employed and, um, and their health. So one of the ongoing research projects that I am involved in, in we are analyzing the, the national registers and looking the, at the self-employed in different sectors. We have uh, seven or eight industrial sectors in the labor market that we are uh, studying. And we all also um, take the size of the enterprise and legal form uh, into account. And we are doing now analysis and looking at these uh, self-employed people in different sectors um, in association with the mortality risk and risk of hospitalization. And in the following studies, we are going to compare the uh, self-employed with employed people in the same industrial sector to get to know whether there is a, a difference in the mortality risk and risk of um, hospitalization. And why is this very important? For us in Sweden, uh, it is quite interesting because uh, considering that we don't have so much previous research about this group, there is a very strong pro-self-employed dialogue, political dialogue in Sweden. 
So many groups in the labor market who belong in the marginalized group, they are like uh, um, inspired to start their own companies. And you, as you know, in Sweden we have a monarchy and the Swedish prince, Daniel, he started a foundation recent, recently to support young people to start their own companies. And uh, this is quite risky, keeping in mind that we don't know actually how, uh, how self-employment affects health of people and how, how it could influence public health. So there is lots of knowledge gaps and lots of work to do regarding this group. And let's go to the employed. So because this is uh, the group where most of the uh, studies into health inequalities has been uh, conducted. And, um, and of course you can, you can um, define uh, the position of the employed in uh, many ways. And it's normally defined based on occupation, what kind of work people have and very many uh, class, theoretically by, uh, based class schemes are available to define the position of um, employed people on the labor market. For instance, here we have like uh, five different levels. We have the professionals, managerial and technical, skilled, non-manual, and then two groups for the manual workers, skilled and unskilled manual workers. And uh, on the labor market, stratification takes uh, part. And soci society alloc allocates power and wealth and uh, re uh, resources to these uh, social positions. And uh, the competition for these very attractive positions take place at the labor market. And whether, you are, whether individuals are able to compete depends very much on their social background their age, gender, ethnicity, uh, occupation, uh, um, educational level, and so forth. So at the contextual level, educational opportunities um, and discrimination in the labor market uh, are factors which has an impact on the social stratification. And I would like to now give you an example how discrimination can express uh, can be expressed in in the labor market. One interesting e example of discrimination in the labor market uh, comes from Finland. It's a study by Herkonen and colleagues, and they analyzed the effects of obesity on unemployment, and found that obese women with obese and the BIAMI index is uh, 30 or over 30. So they, they studied um, obesity and unemployment and found that obese women have a significantly higher risk of unemployment. And uh, this uh, risk uh, remained even if the analysis was controlled for age, level of education and other related factors. So the obese women had a higher risk of unemploy unemployment compared to women who were not obese. And so furthermore, the general weaker occupational position of the uh, obese women tended also to, to translate to lower earnings. So overall, obese women were more likely to have a weaker labor market attachment and hold socioeconomically lower positions. And what is quite interesting that similar results were not found among men. So obesity was completely unrelated to the risk of unemployment among men. <coughs> so I find this, these results quite interesting and a an, an clear indication of the presence of gender discrimination in the Finnish labor market, which is very similar than the Swedish labor market. So uh, we are just waiting to get these results replicated in Sweden. <coughs> and this, this may be a form of in inequality that 
have an increasing significance in future, considering that we, the number of overweight people has doubled in most European countries over the past decades. So this is one example of how inequalities are ex expressed in working life. So, related to that study, that study of unemployment, obesity and earnings, I would like to show you the development of life expectancy in Sweden among when, men and women according to educational level across time. So these, these um, figures are from 1986 to 2006, so it's a period of 20 years. And it's, it's about life expectancy at uh, the age of 30. So we can see that life ex expectancy is increasing for every educa ed educational group. So uh, just to say that the red uh, color is for the lowest group, lowest educational group. Uh, the blue is the medium and the green is the highest educational level. And life expectancy is increasing for every group. We can also see that the increase is um, larger for men, generally in all these uh, educational groups. And I would like to highlight one group specially. And it is um, the where, the where the increase is very, very modest. And it's, it's the group, maybe you already have noticed, it's the group of uh, women with the lowest education. So during this 20 year period, the, their life expectancy increased only 0 0.7 years. So this is also an indication, and w what is important here also that usually when you look at men and women as groups and uh, not divided in, uh, in uh, educational levels, so the life expectancy of women in most countries is uh, higher than among men, but when you, when you split or when you stratify like this, in, like in these figures, you can see the, the shift happened uh, about year 2000, that those men with the highest uh, educational level now have a, a higher life expectancy compared to those women with the lowest educational level. So we can see clear differences of life, life expectancy according to um, educational level. And with these figures, I, would li I, I wanted to show you that there is uh, one group that is uh, especially vulnerable in the labor market. And uh, this is the group of uh, low educated women. We know, we know also that risk factors tend to <coughs> cluster that, that in certain groups. And for instance, lone parenthood is uh, uh, more common in, uh, in lower educated women, among with other risk factors. So there is evidence of gender discrimination in the labor market in the Nordic countries, including Sweden, and also ethnic discrimination, uh, which, is, which is the theme of a, another ongoing research project at Center for Health Equity Studies, in which I am participating. Uh, for instance, I, I can by, uh, shortly comment for instance, it is more difficult for foreign-born individuals with uh, equivalent e education and human capital, I mean experience, work experience and education is the same, but it's more difficult for foreign-born to get a job in Sweden. So we have foreign-born doctors and engineers working as taxi drivers, so the status incongruence is very clear in this group. Even if they have high education, their social position based on the occupation can be very low. And also other interesting studies about foreign born uh, are showing that uh, if you change your name, if you change your original name to a name that sounds more like Swedish, you can increase your possibilities to get a job. So we have this kind of research also which I find uh, very provocative and, and uh, a clearly um, a proof that there is discrimination in the labor market. And previous studies uh, when it comes to the foreign-born 
we don't have like uh, we don't uh, register race in our um, uh, national registers. We have only uh, 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 country of birth. So so immigrants they and refugees are born somewhere else. So we can look at foreign-born individuals compared to to natives. Um, so yeah, so, the, so uh, discrimination is there, and uh, when it comes to foreign-borns, uh, research into foreign-borns, uh, not so much uh, research has been done uh, in relation to health, and even less when it comes to uh, working conditions. And this is, uh, this is even um, that we know that the working conditions are very different for foreign-born and natives because it's difficult to get a job that corresponds with the education. So many foreign-born are in lower, lower jobs than, than their education. And also, when it comes to refugees in Sweden, Sweden is one of the countries uh, in Europe that uh, receives uh, most refugees nowadays per capita, relatively. And, uh, and that's good because the, the, the situation in, in many countries in Syria and Egypt is very dramatic. But it's very difficult for refugees in Sweden to get a job, to get a footing on the labor market. And that's why many of them um, take work in informal labor markets. And we don't have any registered data to study that. So, so this also needs different type of research methods to, to study actually the working conditions and working life of refugees in the informal labor market. So um, informal labor markets are sometimes more difficult to study and also the size of the impo uh, informal labor markets varies uh, across countries depending on welfare systems, but still they exist in everywhere. So, uh, let's go back to social inequalities in health and, and whether uh, work contributes to this uh, social gradient. Most of the f studies in, in um, health inequalities um, research uh, uh, defines uh, people according to different uh, so social indicators, uh, social class, uh, income, and uh, previous research has, has looked at uh, how it, whether uh, adverse working conditions can explain something from this uh, gradient in health. And another uh, technique has been to look at if, is there a moderation? Could it be so that those in the lowest socioeconomic position with the highest uh, uh, exposures in working life have the, the most uh, increased risk of uh, ill health? And according to research systematic uh, review by Hoven and Segrist, which is based on 17 prospective observational studies of employed cohorts, they find that there is a moderate support for the mediate mediation hypothesis, which means that the odds ratio or so hazard ratios of, the, of health according to the socioeconomic position re uh, were reduced uh, in a ma majority of anal analysis when introducing the work characteristics, characteristics in the model. And there is also evidence in favor of the moderation hypothesis in some studies demonstrating stronger risks, stronger effects of adverse work on health among those people with, with the lowest uh, socioeconomic position. So these are the, the two techniques, or the two uh, hypotheses that has been uh, explored in, in uh, earlier research. Uh, and of course, what kind of exposure um, is in question, whether is it's psychosocial or whether is it's uh, uh, physical exposure, uh, heavy work, uh, heavy loads, you have to be able to lift heavy loads 
uh, and so forth, um, and what kind of health outcome, whether it is um, Ill, uh, mental ill health, cardiovascular outcomes, or, or musculoskeletal diseases, depending on the exposure and the outcome, also the uh, mediation, the, the, the size of the mediation effect uh, varies, of course. So, just quickly about the meso level, the workplace level, as I have defined it, uh, the meso level. Uh, it is very seldomly uh, included in studies of health inequalities. Uh, however, in research in the occupational health, studies also look at their organizational conditions uh, and their, how they affect working conditions and, and worker health. So I'm giving you just a couple of examples here. For instance, uh, about lean production. Maybe you are familiar of lean production. I have also seen studies of lean production uh, from Brazil, so there are some. Uh, lean production is a model that originated in automobile industry from the assembly lines. And uh, this way of organizing work, the, the aim was to make it more efficient and productive and, and to, to increase the quality. Um, and uh, nowadays lean production is very popular in Sweden and we see big organizations implementing this model. But however, previous and present research shows that lean, lean model, the lean model of organizing work, generally has negative influences on work environment. The characteristics of lean production such as standardization, waste elimination, resource reduction, improvement of quality and productivity, and just-in-time production, they have implications for the organization of daily work at the workplaces. And in many cases, work intensification is reported. You have to, less people have to do more, work get more hectic, and so forth. And of course, this also uh, has an influence on workers' health and well-being. And also impacts on job control, social support uh, at work, and other features of the psych psychosocial work environment are described uh, in the liter literature that the, this way of organizing work also influences uh, work environment. And another uh, similar model uh, of organizing work is the new public management. It's not new, it has been around for a while, uh, but uh, together with lean, it is very popular in Sweden. And the public, uh, new public management, uh, it's, it's, um, it's uh, used in the pu public sector, in, at hospitals and other authorities. Uh, and it al also has a focus on efficiency, increasing the efficiency and quality, but with evident consequences on working conditions. So this was shortly about the organizational meso level. So let's look at the worker level, the, uh, where worker experience their, their work environment. And I'm sure that you, many of you have worked with the Karasek model, the demand control support model, uh, which is one of the uh, work stress models together with effort reward imbalance model by, by Segrist. We, uh, these two models are the most common used, commonly used in uh, psychosocial uh, uh, work environment research. And uh, these models has be, have been around uh, 30 years, 40, 30 years. And now what we are seeing, uh, there are, and they have been studied all around the world in different contexts, in Brazil, in China, Japan, in uh, America, uh, and uh, Europe. But what we are now seeing are the possibilities of meta-analysis coming from uh, from a consortium of, um, let me see, what's the name of it? Um, 
IPD consortium uh, established 2008. And uh, these are, uh, this uh, consortium uses data from 13 different uh, European cohort studies by pooling the data and, and doing meta-analysis. And here's a link for you if you, if you want to have a list of, of studies. I think there are now uh, 11 studies, and most of them are now focusing on coronary heart disease because this was the outcome that the uh, uh, Karasek model first looked at. Uh, it was among the uh, first health outcomes. And I, I quickly reviewed for you to say uh, to present for you here uh, results for coronary heart disease uh, from this meta-analysis uh, based on 13 European cohorts. And also the Whitehall cohort is uh, included uh, together with uh, a couple of Swedish cohorts and, and, and cohorts from Finland. And the, th the results from this meta-analysis shows that job strain increased the hazard ratio for job strain was 1.23 versus to no, no job strain. So the risk of coronary heart disease was 23% higher in those people with job strain com compared to those with no job strain. And they also calculated the population attrib attributable risk for job strain, which was 3.4 in this study. Another study, uh, by Needhammer and, and colleagues that used, uh, that looked at uh, 31 countries in Europe and cardiovascular disease, they found a uh, population attributable risk um, for cardiovascular disease and for job strain to be 4.5%. Um, so you could uh, argue whether this is much or uh, little. Um, and we can come back to that. Uh, another important area in this uh, research uh, into psychosocial work environment has been when we, when we look at cardiovascular disease, which has been one of the outcomes mostly studied in, um, in this research, is what are, the, what are the mechanisms that increases risk? Uh, is there a direct effect? from job strain to cardiovascular disease, or what are the mechanisms? And uh, the common opinion has been that uh, blood pressure plays a role. And uh, also studies, meta-analysis from this uh, IPD work consortium, now based on eight European cohort studi studies, uh, show that job strain was linked to adverse lifestyle and diabetes but there was no uh, associate association between job strain, clinical blood pressure or blood lipids. And I know that uh, um, at ELSA cohort, uh, these are also important uh, issues to study and uh, other uh, cohorts in, in, in at Fiocruz have looked at this. And when it comes to blood pressure, they didn't find any association but results from the uh, United States with uh, Paul Landsberg and colleagues who have studied uh, the ambulatory blood pressure, they uh, recently also conducted a, a meta-analysis and systematic review. And uh, they conclude that single exposure to job strain in cross-sectional studies was, was actually associated with higher work systolic and diastolic ambulatory blood pressure. And they also conclude that job strain is a risk factor for blood pressure elevation. So these are some very fresh uh, results from this, this research. And uh, this is actually my last slide. I see some tired faces, but uh, what I'm trying to do now uh, you see, uh, I'm trying to wrap, wrap this up and, and present a model and discuss with you a model uh, of causal pathways from society, society context and the social position of individuals to health. How does everything um, go together? How does the social context influence 
um, individual social positions and uh, the pathway to ill health. So this model was presented by um, Finn Diedrichsen uh, and colleagues. He's from Denmark, a very famous health inequalities uh, researchers. Um, and this model presents five different mechanisms. And the first of them is social stratification. When we talk about working life, the stratification takes place at the labor market. Individuals compete for the attractive positions. And uh, stratification gives individuals uh, different social positions, which are, in fact, uh, associated with specific exposures, risks, uh, for instance, at the workplace, uh, which also uh, increase the risk for uh, disease or an injury, injury or ill health. And, and also, when you get ill, um, have some social and, and uh, consequences. Uh, but also, uh, the mechanism number two here is differential exposure. So your social position is uh, associated with not only uh, risk factors at work, but many, many type of risk factors depending on your social position. And to be exposed to many risk factors at the same time, of course, increases your susceptibility to, to become ill. So the mechanism number three here is differential susceptibility, which could uh, uh, capture genetic and, and uh, uh, biological factors, as well as, um, as uh, life course factors, for instance, uh, conditions in, in uh, childhood and, and, uh, and uh, adult life, how they also um, uh, affect uh, your, your susceptibility in, in older age. So the fourth mechanism here in this model is differential consequences. So depending on your social position, your risk factors, your uh, differential exposure and your specific risk factors, uh, you also get specific illnesses. For instance, we could uh, uh, take an example from my previous research where, we, where I have looked at stroke. So depending on your social position and your exposures, uh, your risk for stroke uh, also varies and it's, it's, the, it's largest among people with, uh, with the lowest social, um, socioeconomic position. And whether uh, what the co social consequences are when you have become ill, when you have had a stroke, also uh, depends very much on your social position. For instance, what kind of work you have. If you are a, a man manager, maybe you have uh, access to work, uh, to work uh, related health care at your workplace, uh, compared to if you're a worker or, or a non-skilled worker, you don't have these uh, possibilities to get quickly into in the care. And we know that stroke is very um, disabling disease. So the social po uh, conditions of stroke are very severe compared, for instance, to, to a heart attack from which you can recover relatively quickly. So whether, whether you come back to the labor market uh, depends very much after a stroke, depends very much who you are and how quick you get to, uh, to care and whether you are able to get back uh, to work or whether you exit from the labor market. And this is also, uh, this was the mechanism, more or less, and this is also a policy model and the letters A, B, C, D are uh, places where interventions could take place. And as you see, interventions to increase, uh, decrease social inequalities in health can take place in very different levels, on macro level, at workplace level, on individual level, at the same time, and also uh, at different periods of uh, people's life. Um, so for my own research, this model has been very helpful to, to make all these complex uh, pieces to find their places. So I wanted to 
share this model with you. It's used very much in, in different publications in um, health inequalities research, uh, maybe mostly in the Europe. So this is what I would like to end my presentation with, and I'm very happy. I know that this was quite quick and you might be confused. Uh, so this is a nice picture from Stockholm, uh, from my window at Chess. And uh, I'm very, very happy to hear your comments and to discuss and, and uh, maybe answer some questions, if I may. And also to hear your thoughts about uh, health inequalities and in working life, especially. So I would like to end here. And thank you. <laughs>